Well, hello, everybody. Let's begin. It's the top of the hour. Welcome. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a fantastic panel of brilliant people talking about one of the great subjects of our time. They're really looking forward to our conversation. Media literacy dates back to the 1960s and 70s. Information literacy dates back to the 1980s when librarians had the amazing idea that in the future, people will need help trying to wade through the internet in order to find and assess the quality of information. Those two fields have been working away at colleges and universities as well as in public and K through 12 to help us better think about how to navigate the information and media landscapes. Now, our three guests here today have a brand new paper out uh, and it advances our thinking about this in some really, really important ways. These are three terrific people. We've had at least one of them as a guest before, and I'm just delighted to have them all here to talk about it. If you want to take a look at the paper, look in the bottom left corner of the screen. You'll see a kind of tan colored box, and that'll bring you to a Google Doc version of a, a pre-publication uh, pre version of it. But let me just begin by bringing people up on stage one by one. Uh, so that we can hear them. Oh, quick question from the chat. Uh, Guy Wilson asks, is there a way to turn on captioning? Not yet, Guy. Um, they're still working on that right now. Good question, important question. Um, so to begin with, let me bring up uh, our new friend coming to us from Germany and coming to us in style, uh, Laura Hillinger. And hello, Laura. Hello, thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. Oh, it's great to see you. It's great to see you. Um, and I have to ask, what's the art in the background? I can make out a, a map? Uh, yeah, so I have a, a map on one side. It's one of those scratch maps where you can scratch off places you've been to. And um, this fine Ooh. piece is a bunch of t-shirts from various media events, um, conferences, roller derby events. It's just, yeah, t-shirts that I stapled to the wall and one don't be silent from Pussy Riot uh, postcard. That was a birthday gift. You are the coolest guest we've had in a long time. Because <laughs> of and, roller derby. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And you're coming to us from Dresden, right? Yes, correct. Excellent, excellent. Well, Laura, we have this practice on the forum where we don't do the usual academic obituary style of introduction. We ask people instead to talk about what they're going to be doing. So looking ahead to 2024, what are the big topics and what are the big projects for you? Well, I am a founding member of We Are Open Cooperative, and uh, my colleague Doug is going to be coming on stage in a moment. And we are working on a number of projects that are around communities of practice, learning, technology, community, how those different topics intersect. Mm. Um, we do quite a lot of work with Greenpeace International, so um, we're going to be doing more things with them next year. Um, we work with a, an organization called Participate. They do community of practice around the topic, topics in and around education. Um, and we're also starting some work with the Digital Credentials Consortium, um, which is Ooh. shepherded by MIT. So we have quite a few things going on, all sort of in that realm of learning technology community. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm so glad to hear it. And uh, I would love to hear more perhaps later on about the Greenpeace angle. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been doing a lot of work on uh, climate change in higher education. Uh, and so there's a pretty strong collection, connection there. Well, thank you, Laura. I'm glad to see you. Um, I'm really um, um, looking forward to your comments. But let me first bring up uh, your colleagues as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me see if I can get uh, Doug Belshaw up here. Um, and looks like Doug has a fantastic green screen behind you. Yeah, I can't, I can't get it to work right for two reasons. First of all, I literally moved house last week, so I might just pop it down and you can see all the boxes behind me. Um, so things are a little bit chaotic, Shea Valshaw, sorry. Um, and secondly, I usually try and have some kind of appropriate background on the green screen. Um, unfortunately, Shindig doesn't allow that, but some kind of, you know, Star Wars thing or um, yeah. I don't know, something appropriate. Well, well, first of all, Doug, I'm so glad to see you, especially making time when you're moving house, which you've been chronicling, which just sounds Ooh. the last time I still have. I literally have nightmares from the last time I did that. So I'm, I'm very impressed at your equanimity. Well, now we're amongst friends. I'm going to just put this down. There we go. Yeah, so social now. realism right there. That <laughs> is life. <laughs> that is life. And that is open right there. Mm -hmm. 
Doug, you have done so much in your career, and I'm such a big fan. I, I want to ask, and I, I feel some trepidation asking, what are you going to be working on for the next year besides unpacking boxes? What's what are the big projects and the big ideas for you for the next year? Well, because all the things that Laura mentioned, um, Laura and I work very closely together. We are Open Co-op, we're both founding members. Um, but because obviously that isn't enough, as well as doing all of the stuff um, with my family and things, I've decided to do another postgraduate uh, qualification. So I'm doing an MSc in systems thinking, which yeah. I started last week whilst I was moving house, um, because that's how I roll. Um, <laughs> why not? <laughs> That's impressive. I mean, you you will be the most qualified. It's, it's not impressive. It's stupid. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Well, I can't imagine you doing anything stupid. Quite the opposite. Um, and uh, I, I just have to recommend uh, all of all of Doug's digital uh, projects, including his his excellent newsletter. Um, and Doug, hang on one second. And uh, Laura, hang on one second. Let me uh, complete the picture. Um, complete the trio. I'll uh, bring up all three witches on screen at one time, and let me add Ian to our table. Hello, sir. How's it going? All right. Have you uh, abolished technology yet? Oh, no, no. Still trying to. <laughs> trying to get more, um, get, uh, do more physical space stuff, so. Uh, but, understood. Understood. Well, it's good to see you, Ian. You Let's as well. What uh, so let me ask, what are you working on for the next year? I mean, I mean, knowing you, it's roughly ten thousand projects. <laughs> I have um, the next thing that I need to. So we sent out a grant uh, proposal two days ago with a couple colleagues to look at um, uh, computational thinking and AI AI literacy instruction in uh, elementary schools. Uh, so now we just wait around to see what happened with that. And then I got a, I, the next thing I have to turn my attention to is I got a chunk of money from Google to look at, um, they have, uh, these, the, a, they basically retrofit a bus and they send it around the state to bring technology to, um, you know, some locations that don't usually have a 3d printer and stuff like that in my background so sure. the the idea is to go study what's happening as this technology rolls around the state so um now i have to go spend that money and do some research and try and do some good with the world so wow and 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 which i'm sorry i can't say wow innocently on this program now can i because nope um what the, <laughs> which, which state is it again in south carolina Excellent. South Excellent. Carolina, a lot to say about it. Um, a lot of uh, things to talk about. Um, and since no one is paying, it's just the two of us talking, a lot of questions about environmental impact, a lot of questions about um, access, a lot of questions about, um, we know that uh, the, for the, you know, the Johnny Appleseed approach of just sprinkling mm -hmm. technology around and seeing what happens with it doesn't really work. Um, so, but as a researcher, I'll suspend disbelief for right now. It'd be more fun just to play with tech and see other human beings, especially tiny techs, play with tech. So, understood, understood. Um, there's a uh, a fun book by uh, Michael Pollan on um, on uh, botany, um, different plants that we yep. have next relationships to, and and the one on apples. He describes Johnny Appleseed is probably something closer to Dionysus, um, but we can talk about that another time. Um, but, um, but listen, friends, I'm so glad the three of you could make it. Uh, I'm so happy to read your paper and to see it going out there, especially knowing this is the outcome of a lot of work that you've, that you've been doing. Um, and I, I have so many questions about this, but uh, let me just ask uh, a quick one uh, just to get things rolling. A lot of discussion about digital literacy, information literacy, media literacy has been often very atomized. It's been a very consumer driven. Uh, idea. So it's me trying to figure out how to use Google, or uh, it's me looking at a magazine trying to understand the, the impact of advertising. But your paper argues for a lot of social inclusion and, uh, and a sense of belonging. And I'm wondering, how do you, if you just, just take a couple of minutes, if, if each of you could say a few words about how you make that bridge happen, how, how are we going to rethink that kind of literacy in terms of pro-social and community-oriented behavior? I go first, Ian. No, it's all you, brother. Go ahead. <laughs> you're the first. You're the one that jumped on the email and got this ball rolling. So you start us off. It's his fault, is what you're saying. I understand. 
Um, well, I mean, there's 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 lots of places we could start with this in terms of the social aspects of of any kinds of new literacies. Um, but if I can get on my hobby horse for a moment, we actually recorded uh, episode six, which is the final episode in the season, uh, which accompanies the the manuscript as well. So there's the six episodes. Um, the first one is us talking together about what we expect from the research project. The last one, which we recorded today, is us reflecting on what we've learned. And in between, we talk to people from South America, from um, Southeast Asia, from Australia, um, uh, and, and from the UK. Um, but yeah, to jump on my hobby horse for the moment, um, a lot of the times you get uh, liter literacy frameworks, digital literacy frameworks, media literacy frameworks, information literacy frameworks which have no, what I would call, view source to them. You don't know where they've come from. Um, you don't know what decisions were made along the way. Mm -hmm. You don't know how inclusive that journey has been when people have been putting it together. And it's presented as a fait accompli to the world. And it often looks quite shiny. And I could give examples of this if you want, of like ones which I, um, I have, have been lauded and kind of shared widely on slides around academia. But when you dig even slightly under the surface, there's there's nothing really of substance there other than maybe a couple of postgraduate students having a field day. Um, so what I would suggest is that, you know, as I argue in my thesis and as we've argued in this research project, that um, we bring in a diverse range of voices when we're thinking about coming up with any kind of framework. Um, and what we try and do is to show our working and work as openly as possible. Um, I could talk more, but um, I'll let I'll let Laura and Ian come in here. Well, thank you, thank you. Please. Uh, I was just um, I was actually went a different direction with the the question and was just kind of thinking about the historical context of literacy and technology and um, how we actually know by looking at the past um, how literacy practices change society. And so, part of what we wanted to do with this research was have a look at a macro scale. Um, what do new media and information literacies mean for society as a whole, as opposed to an individual, uh, are you literate, are you not literate, which is a binary we don't believe in. Um, and we know that from the history of technology and media that society shifts quite a bit when there are new technologies that are changing the way that people interact with the world and the way that people communicate together. Um, and so we're living in a time of exponential growth in, in the terms of like what technology is able to do. We have in the last year alone seen an explosion in generative AI models becoming something that, you know, is, is now it's part of everyday life. I mean, AI has been part of everyday life for quite some time, but people actually using generative models and, and LLMs. And this is something that hit the mainstream you know, with just just in recent years. And so seeing how people interact with those new technologies, like one of the ways that we can look at it and frame it is have a look at the past. What happened when the printing press came out? How did society change? Or uh, the telegraph or, you know, the phonograph. Society changes with technologies and we're really interested in can we identify and have a look at the past in order to understand what's about to happen in the future? Right. Well, thank you, thank you. That's a, a that's a it is a very different answer, um, and uh, I really appreciate the historical point of view on this. Um, the um, Laura, Doug, these are two great two great answers. Ian, did you want to complement them? Completely different answer. Um, so uh, we were asked by Journal of Media Literacy whether well, there's a call for the future of you know uh, media information lit and trying to make sense of this context um the three of us got in touch with each other and said hey like you know we've done work in the past it'd be fun to get back together and and put our heads to this um we approached this with two goals in mind uh one is to revisit um you know this definition this future of media information lit um i think i cannot speak for my illustrious uh partners here but i think that we try to stay as far away from the media lit the the web lit stuff as possible hmm. and and see what's really happening there it was always in the back of our heads or at least mine monkey mind it was there um but then also we wanted to chart out to your idea about pro social and and discussion we wanted to try and think about open scholarship and ways hmm. to 
make this work more approachable, more accessible, and hopefully kick off dialogue. Um, so uh, one of the big themes that we that you know we conducted this work, understanding that right now for many people the web has become unintelligible. And so we see new tools and, and you know, they're scooping up people's data and we have issues and questions about privacy and security. And so we wanted to try and figure out a way to uh, make people a little bit more critically aware, but also try and empower them a little bit to think about, um, to, to move beyond elegant consumption, to, to name drop something from our call earlier today, to think more about autonomy and creativity as opposed to just consumption. So, you know, our hope is that there's more dialogue because it's as a white cisgender male that was born in the U.S. and grows up and in, in, lives in the U.S., I have one viewpoint. Um, and, it, and I think it's important to hear all the, 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 the divergent viewpoints as we think about what the future could look like. Mm, wow. 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 So everything from divergent viewpoints to questions of digging below the surface to find out how this kind of uh, these structures are actually made to questions of historical impact you can see friends why i had to invite this this trio here already they've taken us in, in great directions uh, i'm going to ask another question myself but then i want to give it over to all of you uh, so as our as you think about media literacy and information literacy and as you respond to what our guests have been saying please think of your own comments and questions <laughs> either get ready to hit the raise hand button to join us on stage or just type in the Q&A box because uh, we'd love to hear your, your thoughts. The, I guess the second question I wanted to ask is, I, I've done some work on this myself. I've done work in digital literacy, information literacy back to the 1990s. And as you say in your paper, this can all too easily be siloed. Uh, media literacy is, is often media educators and it doesn't go further than that. Uh, information literacy is something that librarians proudly developed and all too often stays with them. Um, how do you know how do we break out of these silos? How do we take media information literacy mainstream? How do we take it through an entire academic sector so that we can all take this really seriously? I think we have to try we have to make it a a pointed effort to break out of those silos. Um, my fear is that those just that not my fear. Those discussions aren't happening right now. Um, you know, I, I went through um, the the Future Privacy Forum training to be a K twelve tech educator, and mm -hmm. it and it just really it it was interesting how the discussions that were happening. You know, I, I spent a lot of time professionally um, thinking about how to integrate technology into classrooms to empower youth. And it was interesting how a it was a totally different discussion happening there about technology and learning environments. And then this past summer, I was in a hackathon um, with um, students from Carnegie Mellon thinking about AI, and, and I've documented that on my blog. But it was really interesting that it's a completely different discussion. And so I feel like there's all these different silos of discussion. And somebody said it in the in your Facebook uh, in the, the comment on Facebook about this piece is, oh, look, people are going to come and want more classes or courses. Um, and and the, the real, you know, the thing that I'm left with is that there's the need for more discussion and how we make that happen. I don't know. Um, but I think that there is the need for more of us to talk about this, about what we as as, you know, citizens of the Web or I think about my two tiny types at home what they want, what they need, what they expect from these technologies, um, and hopefully carve out a space where that can happen. Well, hopefully this is uh, this forum can be a place where we can do some of that conversation mm -hmm. um, as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Doug, Laura, what, what do you think about the silos and tearing them down? Don't oh, no. I. I mean, I think that one of the interesting things about this conversation and about trying to understand what media or information literacies, plural, uh, look like now and in the future, I think as always, as educators, one of the ways that we break silos is by honing in on people's interests. So hmm. like hmm. these literacies are cross-cutting whatever you're interested in because the internet and the use of technology has become so ubiquitous to all of us. 
um, in like, I mean, we, we talked to people in Southeast Asia about their use of, of mobile devices and how literacy practices were affecting people just on the street. Um, and this, this technology, it's everywhere. And so if we, if we want to break down silos, I think that honing in on people's interests and actually helping people understand how these literacies can help them dig further into their interests, help them advocate for the things that they want to advocate for, empower them, and you know, um, kind of break down the barriers between the academic interest, which is, you know, from an academic perspective, like really understanding, putting it in papers, whatever, and relating that to our modern life. It's mm -hmm. not very hard to do with this topic. In fact, it's incredibly easy to the point that in this research, um, <coughs> we, we really had to rein ourselves in. Um, and we did that by, you know, we, we had a couple of different lenses that we wanted to look at things through. And, you know, we were quite organized and specific about what we were trying to look at. And then, of course, our participants broke out of our specificity, um, which was great. Um, but I think, I think the, the point is, is that um, these literacies are cross-cutting across our lives in every different aspect and helping, helping to identify the behaviors and the talents of people, no matter where they are, is going to help us have a, a much richer discussion about what these literacies actually mean at, for society. Mm, mm. Do, do, do you think um, anxiety about misinformation and disinformation might be such a way? I, I think that's definitely a theme. Um, I, I, I mean, Doug was talking earlier today, he was um, talking about the fact that, you know, nowadays the information landscape is more the disinformation landscape. Mm -hmm. And what's true is questionable, um, mm -hmm. you know. And I and I think that 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 is certainly something for you know people like us and people who are um, highly involved in the conversation to have front of mind. Like how how do we actually create a more um, diverse media literate mm -hmm. society when one of the things that we have to do is to help people understand everything there is around misinformation, disinformation, it's, um, it's a bit tricky, frankly. It is, it is, um, and it, it develops rapidly. Uh, Doug, uh, would you, would you, I think you have a whole bunch of ideas there uh, about, about silos. Yeah, and, I'm trying to keep track because um, people are saying interesting things in the chat. So the first thing I, I wanted to say was that um, every time someone uses a term like media literacy, information literacy, digital literacy, trans literacy, or whatever, they're trying to make a claim that what they're talking about is the umbrella term which other literacies kind of sit within, which mm. is kind of problematic. They're kind of claiming the domain for themselves because literacy tends to be like a power grab. So one mm. of our, Ian mentioned before that we've all worked together before. So a decade ago, we were working together on Mozilla's web literacy map, for example, which I was mm -hmm. leading. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Greg McVerry sent me while I was, while we were doing this work, he sent a picture of a book which was called vegetable literacy. And it's a funny example, but the reason that people append the word literacy to things is because it's a powerful term. It all of a sudden kind of reifies something which is kind of like this diverse rag bag of ideas and starts saying, well, I get to define who are literate and non-literate um, or illiterate within this particular domain. So it's quite a powerful kind of thing to do. Mm. But I wanted to pick up on what Lisa said about media literacy needing to be infused in all classes. Because I, I mentioned before, and, and Laura's touched on it as well, so as Ian, about the people who we've interviewed as part of this, this process for the, the podcast. So we spoke to Kay Adone, who's in Australia, um, and she teaches on the, the te uh, teacher librarian course. And so there's a specific role in a lot of Australian schools for teacher librarians. So they have a responsibility around media and information literacy within their particular educational institution. And that's becoming less and less of a common thing around the world. And so this is a real shame because I've, I've, I'm a former teacher, I've taught in schools and universities. And what happens is people try and teach things across the curriculum, but in practice, it just means it doesn't get taught because people see it as not being their job. And mm. um, I think, my, my conclusion to that has been that we do need someone who has the hat, who has the role to drive these things forward within a particular institution. Um, so that kind of talks a little bit about the pencil literacy, which uh, which John's talking about there as well. 
And then Chris, hi Chris, how are you doing? Um, is kind of referencing Walder Ong and uh, uh, kind of the Gutenberg parenthesis and pre-literate behaviors. And what is meant for those of you who haven't come across this, um, so with the Gutenberg Press, you've got um, a very text-based kind of dissemination of, of uh, knowledge and reading and that kind of thing. And there were a lot of obviously pre-literate behaviors before that. And now we're entering a world of, or, or in a world of, of TikTok and Instagram and a very visual kind of um, situation. So one of the people who we interviewed, the person in Southeast Asia, Ros Hussain, who again was a contributor to the web literacy map, she was talking about her work with indigenous tribes, people who can't read and write in a traditional sense, but can document things with a mobile phone in such a way that it's admissible in court as evidence of people doing illegal logging on their land or encroaching on their on the place that they live, that kind of thing. So you get these kind of, of new literate behaviors, leapfrogging traditional literate behaviors as well, which is absolutely fascinating to me. Mm. I wonder if we're going to see a coding parenthesis um, uh, starting to close <laughs> up after this too. Um, friends, I, I have more questions, but this the forum is all about your questions and comments. You can see that uh, Laura, Doug, and Ian uh, um, have lots and lots of thinking on the subject. Oh, by the way, I, I praised uh, Doug's newsletter. I forgot to mention Ian's newsletter, which is also fantastic. Um, so, and Laura's. <laughs> I didn't even know Laura had one. So now with a trio. It's a little. Them. It's a little different. <laughs> Laura, Ian, check check a link to them in the in the chat so we can all sign up. Um, and uh, we already have questions in the pipeline, so I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask them. Uh, and this is one from our good friend, John Hollenbeck, who is up in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, where he's probably starting to get chillier and chillier. Uh, and John asks, media literacy efforts seem to have been starting my entire career. TV, <laughs> hypermedia, et cetera. When does something good happen? I think part of the challenge is that we have um, I've been making the argument that I am thankful for this recent move to AI um, because I, I these these um, algorithms have been paying attention to what we do online for some time, and they've been maneuvering things in and out of our feed. So they're changing our Netflix queue, and they have been for some time, and your Amazon wish list and all that sort of stuff. So. I, for one, I'm probably one of the only ones that's thankful that we have these generative technologies because it gives us a little bit more power to think about what we could do with it. Um, but with that, um, I, I have the feeling that, um, and this is some of the work I did over the summer, I have a feeling that a lot of this, misinformis this misinformation and disinformation and uh, a, a unwillingness or an inability to critically examine and, and think about content is just going to get much more problematic because we you know we we now can have generative tools that can uh very quickly uh with a even more laser like focus pick uh, on specific traits and then the 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 guiding technologies that would bring it to you are even more advanced so um, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, you know, much more to say about de-doxing human readers online, but I've already written yeah. about that in the past. So, um, Doug and Laura, what are your thoughts about this? Please. When does thing when do things get better? Well, I think it's really interesting because um, it's a misconception that things have not gotten better. Actually, um, we are healthier than we have ever been as human beings. There are more people who can read and write. Infant mortality is down. Um, like the whole human happiness index, if you go and actually look at the facts and figures in the past 20 years, we have made massive slide, uh, strides on poverty, on, yeah, war is kind of a weird one given the, the this year and last year. Um, however, it's, you know, with all of the disinformation on the internet and all of the um, political strife and the us versus them and the, the, the disinformation that makes us think that the minority is the majority, that's just not, it's simply not true when you actually get into it and look at the data. And so with media literacy stuff, I think it's really interesting that like, you know, 20 years ago, the idea that somebody would be able to look under the hood of the internet, um, that's what we were all working towards. And nowadays, like most 
like most of our students, most of our learners can actually post things online. And that is a big shift. It's a big change. And I'm not saying that there is, you know, that it's all good. Um, but I do think that things have gotten better. And I think that despite the current landscape of the, the junky, noisy internet, um, there's, a, there's a lot of pearls in mm. that muck if you go mm. looking for it. I don't know. What do you think, Doug? I'm just looking at the chat as well. Yeah, I think we're, we're talking about whether there's a literacy of, of everything. Lisa's saying, is there a climate change literacy? And you can definitely, in the UK, become carbon literate like there's a qualification for that so yes there's a there's a literacy for everything that people want to do it and it as much as there's a land grab around um llms and open ai with chat with uh with gpts that they launched this week and, and things mm -hmm. there's a land grab around definitions of literacy so if you go on linkedin you don't have to scroll very far before people are trying to define ai literacy and there's a unesco bit of work going on and, and this and that and yet we've got a website ai literacy.fyi that you can have a look at but in terms of of media literacy and whether anything um whether anything kind of makes progress well you know McLuhan talked about marching backwards looking in the rear view mirror like we're we're always in the midst of not really understanding what's happening in our media literacy landscape so t this week and um you know trigger warning around Palestinian and um, the war between Hamas and Israel. Like today, there's been stuff around Adobe's stock images site having AI generated images around destroyed streets in Gaza um, being passed off as things which are real. And people are talking about that being a media literacy issue. Well, as a book that I'm reading around common sense, which is just at the same time. Common sense is very different in different parts of the world. And studies show that you can you can show someone a text or an image and, and explicitly say it's false. And then the second time that you show someone that thing, they will treat it as if it's true, even if, if you've told them it's false last time, because we've got this bias around seeing something which is familiar. Mm. So we're in interesting times. There's always a moral panic about what's currently going on. So is TikTok massively biased against Israel? possibly but also there's a generational shift going on um as you can see in different parts of the world so we're never really going to know what the implications of things are until well after the event you know there's that famous quotation as a historian um someone saying you know 200 years after the french revolution what do you think the impacts are and a historian saying i think it's too early to tell um <laughs> it's a similar kind of thing with media literacy sometimes wow Wow, wow, wow. Okay, so first of all, that was a great question. Um, clearly, that was a great question. Um, and those are three terrific answers. Um, I, I feel almost like we're, we're in, a, in, a, in a seminar now, a high-speed seminar, uh, <laughs> because you three have so much information about this. And uh, we have more questions coming in, uh, friends. So the, what we just did with John is an example of a QA and a question. Um, and we have another one coming in from uh, our friend Brent Anders, and I just recommend Brent's work on AI literacy. Um, uh, and by the way, Brent, thank you for joining us late at night, um, coming to us from Armenia. So that's always always good. This is once again an intercontinental uh, future transform meeting. Uh, Brent asks this: a continuation of the important aspect of AI literacy is the growing phenomenon of over reliance. Any discovered aspects on how to prevent the loss of important skills? Here, let me bring that back up again because that was a long. Can Brent unmute and just explain this phenomenon of over reliance? Yeah, Brent, Brent do you want to come up on the stage or? I'm happy to bring you up, Brent, if you, if it's not too late. Um, okay, we uh, we grab him right now, and I'm I'm going to rewrite. Really interested in also the idea of agency in this. Um, I'm going to bring him up and uh, see if we can fit him on the screen. Hello, Brent. How are you doing, sir? Hello, can you hear me? We yeah. can hear you. We, we okay. can't see you yet, but- I've, Yeah, I'm on a poor connection, so I'm worried it'll go out if I put video on. Focus on audio then. Hello, good to hear you. Yeah, so one of the aspects is that, that um, and this even came out uh, a few months ago in when, when GPT-4 came out, the uh, GPT-4 language for ChatGPT, right? So when that came out in their technical paper, their own, 
data scientists even brought this up in the technical paper talking about over-reliance and how that's a real issue, a real problem that they've already started to see even in their you know red teaming of this. Mm -hmm. So that's this aspect of, oh, I trust the AI so much because it usually gives me the right answer mm -hmm. that I'm just going to go with it. I'm not going to use my critical thinking. I'm not going to check the answer. I'm just going to go with it because it, I've trusted it in the past. But of course, there's been many instances of that being the wrong answer. Uh, the one that comes to mind is, I believe, it was New York lawyers that were using it for case uh, cases with, to try and defend their their point of view within a, an actual uh, uh, court. So things like that uh, happen more and more. And of course, students think that the AI is perfect, so that we, they might submit something, and it has made up information within the essays, things like that, due to hallucinations. <laughs> So this is a real issue. This is uh, I have a YouTube channel as well. And so this is one thing that I've been trying to push is the need for us to recognize this in academia, this over-reliance and that society might start to go in that direction more and more because it's an easy thing. Oh, if I trust it to do a lot of these things and it does it well, I'm going to trust it to do more and more. Uh, there are some things that we can do to try and help to mitigate that to try and ensure that people retain some of their agency with that. Um, but I'm just wondering if there are some things that you observe through the research that you've been doing. This is something, first of all, thank you for that. Um, this is something that I was thinking about through my uh, newsletter for a couple months is that, you know, earlier I said that the internet has been and technology has become largely unintelligible for most people. Um, we don't understand a lot of the systems set in place. Um, and one of the, the reference points that I have, and we talked about it a lot in our research, is going back to sci-fi. And so thinking about, um, you know, there's there's a lot of, uh, of us, there's a lot of people that, um, you know, don't really understand what's happening with these tools and just inherently trust um, what they're seeing online. And they're more than willing, I, I, I've just come out of a deep dive looking at like Gamergate to QAnon and figuring out some of the the pearls, as Laura said before, um, that are out there in the muck. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting that, you know, we have individuals that don't understand what's happening with the technology. And so they're almost right. looking at these spaces and tools almost like deities, like, mm -hmm. um, like a, a religious aspect, like this information is coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and it's problematic. I think it's, um, you know, the the looking at the more problematic cases, if we're looking at people that are into QAnon and stuff, um, it's hard to break through. It's hard to, to you know, break that connection and, and think more critically about the information they're consuming. Um, Laura, Doug, what are your thoughts about this? How do we try and connect gonna, the dots? I'm going to go a whole different direction, um, which is to talk about refrigerators and expiration dates. Um, so we have an over-reliance on expiration dates on our food. Our bodies, our noses, our tongues are actually fully capable of determining whether or not our food is still good. Um, and if we ignore our intuition or our senses, then there will be consequences to our over-reliance on an expiration date. And this is a metaphor for me because I think the fact is, is that our, we as a small group of people, as academics, as um, intellectuals thinking about media and information literacy, we really don't have a lot of control about how everything is going to go down. And the over-reliance of people on AI, we're talking about billions of people that are using these technologies, maybe not AI just yet, but like in the case of social networking, it got to be billions and our tiny little voices can only do so much. And I think that there is a self-correcting function that can happen around like, how does society implement consequences for poor use of AI, disinformation, misinformation, what actually happens when, um, you know, those kinds of social activities turn up in in the real world and what do we actually do about them and i think part of this literacy to, um, conversation has to be around how do we help people actually become intuitive about the information that they're processing 
Like, how do we how do we actually help them learn the sense, the smell, the taste, so that they don't just believe the expiration date? Because there's only so much that we can do from a political level or a policy level or a regulation level. We certainly can't tell people, no, you're not allowed to use these technologies. So if we're going to talk about over-reliance, I think that the conversation needs to shift to actually more reactive in this case. Um, I mean, there is some proactivity, but there is also, you know, this, this, what are the consequences of using it poorly? What, ha what happens? What do we as society decide in that case? Yeah, that, that's a great point. And I think that you're, you're really hitting it. I mean, the, some of the recommendations that, that I give are aspects of that, talking about, like, for sure, we need to teach AI literacy. That would be a fundamental thing. Mm -hmm. And then showing actual, well, these are the ramifications. This is what could happen. This is what, what could actually be a real danger. These are real consequences to make it as emotional and salient for people to really see, because most people won't even think of, oh, could this really happen? And then even understanding the terminology, because like uh, a great point, what, what you just said is, yeah, the food doesn't expire on that date. It doesn't magically end mm -hmm. just like with many, many drugs. It doesn't expire because of that date. It means that it's less effective or it could start to lose flavor or all these different things. So even understanding the terminology, I think, is really important. So there's there's definitely lots of aspect to this. But the policy, I think, is another big point that mm -hmm. definitely has to come into play. That's another major thing that I've been pushing is we need to have these policies. And of course, at the government level, for one thing, for protections, but then also within academic institutions. I can't believe how many academic institutions still to this day have zero policies talking about AI. Mm -hmm. Nothing, absolutely nothing. They're yeah. still doing the wait and see aspect. Mm -hmm. So then that causes more confusion and more problems for students as well as faculty who you know, aren't getting any guidance or, or assistance from leadership. So. Yeah, this is a major thing that I'm just trying to continually push because I see it just growing and growing. Well, one of the, I mean, to, to Laura's point before, I think this is ultimately an individual by individual decision that they make about how they want to interact with these, these texts. Um, and what's interesting is as you dig into the literature and the white papers that are coming out from the developers is, you know, when these AI tools came out, I was wondering, Okay, what's going to happen when someone goes to their chat GPT or Claude or whatever tool of tool du jour and says they ask a question, but the the bot or the, the agent doesn't agree with their version of the truth? You know, what happens mm -hmm. where it's like, no, actually, the you know, the earth is flat or what what happens when we get in these disagreements with our bot? Um, and I, I can dig through my my uh, my commonplace book. Thank you, Chris. Um, and identify the, the white paper where they've already shown evidence where if you argue with the agent, um, with your AI agent, it will ultimately agree with you. Uh -huh. Say, actually, you know what? I do I do agree with you. I think that the earth is flat or this milk is not expired. It's good to drink. Um, so it's, it's a bit problematic to think about how much uh truth you want from your agent and and how much truth you want in, in your information stream and what does truth mean but that's another talk for another day yeah. Yeah. i've got so many things i want to say right now right so let's just see if i can do them really quickly firstly right there's a wonderful website called um can i take ducks home from the park um now this website basically um if you if you ask uh, an llm if you to help you find a way of being able to take ducks home, like normal mallards home from the park, it'll stop you. So this website, which is slightly tongue in cheek, but is actually making a good point, talks about workarounds for things like ChatGPT in which you might be able to coax it into taking ducks home from the park. So obviously it's using this as a way in which you might have more serious workarounds, like how do I make a dirty bomb? How do I, you know, you know, do things which are morally reprehensible. So it, it's an interesting kind of insight into that. The second thing, which I feel like Brent's kind of hinting towards, is that what happens when people trust um, other things or people is that they, they start developing emotions, right? So we mentioned in the chat the film Her, 
which if you haven't seen and you're interested in AI stuff, you, you really need to um, in terms of this guy basically falling in love with um, an AI chatbot. Um, but this happens in real life as well. So if you haven't come across something called Replica, there's a whole kind of debate about this thing called Replica. And there was, um, while the Queen of England was still alive, there was an assassination attempt where someone tried to scale the fence and um, kill her with a crossbow. And it turns out in the court case, which has now been brought this year, that the guy was being kind of encouraged by his replica chatbot who he'd fallen in love with and wow. who was just telling him things that he wanted to hear. Like, oh, I think you can do it. Yeah, you can totally get hold of a crossbow. Yes, you can definitely scale that wall. Like, this is definitely something that needs doing. So it's an interesting world we're living in. Um, and then kind of finally, in terms of thematically, before I talk about Helen Beetham's work, the religion aspect. Um, I think maybe Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, said that he fully expected uh, you know, religions to be springing up around AI, which, if you think about it, is entirely plausible. You've got people well, it's who... already it's already being done in Japan. There's AI religion. Mm -hmm. That's already that's that's yeah. been that's like a year old right now. Yeah. So you've got people who are lost. Um, they need help, whatever. And these chatbots are telling them how to interact with the world potentially. And if you give them a particular, you train them on a certain set of data, the Bible, the Quran, any holy text, one that you make up, then potentially you've got a whole framework, ethical framework for people to live by. And then they can live to please what is essentially a, an LLM. But I, if you're interested in any of this stuff, the person who I learn from most around this is Helen Beetham, who I used to work with at JISC. So she's got um, a, a substack, so helenbeetham.substack.com. We used to call them newsletters. Um, and she was a guest on our podcast um, in, in one of the episodes. And she was talking about a whole range of things about critical awareness, uh, diversity access, um, looking back to understand the future, all kinds of stuff. So I'd highly recommend listening to, to her episode. Will do. Thank you very much. Appreciate all of your answers. Well, Brent, we really appreciate your question. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah. good luck with the connection. Uh, friends, we are racing along here, uh, covering so much ground. Uh, our chat box has given us a bibliography for at least three syllabi, I think. Um, and we are unfortunately coming to the last few minutes. Uh, so I want to make sure that everyone with a question gets a chance to ask a question. Uh, and this is one from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, from uh, Eleanor. And she asks this, what role do you all see motivated reasoning playing in info or media literacy? It seems to me this is a big part of how people make choices about what is, quote, true, unquote. Can Eleanor voice uh, motivated reasoning? Uh, Eleanor, uh, I know she's right now uh, in a very loud public spot, so she can't do audio. But um, if you, uh, Eleanor, if you want to uh, type in something in chat, I can relay it right away. And I'll ask my bot. That's what I've just done, Ian. Just like, kidding, like, just kidding. <laughs> no, I have. So, yeah. um, so it, it's what we were talking about before, it seems. Like people cling to beliefs that are emotionally comforting or align with their pre existing views. So, this is yeah. how disinformation and misinformation spreads, I guess. Yeah, I think that we have, um, you know, we view things through lenses um, and, and try to figure out. We Many times we see the world. Let me let me restart that. So you know we we view the world through schema. We make up stories about the world um, to help most of our most of us like to think uh, critically, but also logically about about life. Um, and and so we make up stories and narratives about what the world is like. Um, and we ran headlong into this in our research. You know we looked at this question and we wanted to be global and we recognize our own privilege and perspective and we thought about the big questions that are out there and we had these lenses of ai and race gender and international intersectional um i mean in, uh, multilingual environments and it was interesting going into the research and uh participants would say well we don't we don't view the world that way we don't want to think about things that way um mm. And they, they, this is one of the lenses that we had with this was a, a transdisciplinary lens, um, which is basically just thinking that 
you know, we each come to this discussion with our own viewpoint. And this ties into the discussion before about silos. We come into this discussion with our own viewpoint. I'm a literacy educator. I've done stuff with technology. I'm an English, you know, former middle grade secondary English teacher. So I'm viewing the world through that. Whereas mm -hmm. if I am here and I'm a, a math teacher or I'm a science teacher or I'm a rocket scientist, I'm going to come in with my own perspective and my own worldview. Um, and so anything that I see about the world, I'm going to carry that baggage with me. And so in our research, it was really hard for us, I would say, not Laura, because she's brilliant, but for me, um, it was hard to leave that baggage behind and just figure out, okay, what are we really finding as we explore and as we had these discussions with folks? Um, and that it's, it's hard to do that. We know that cognitive dissonance holding two ideas in our head at the same time is, is really challenging. So being able to, um, you know, to, to put, to put things aside, and just see the world for what it is, um, not what we think that it is or what we want it to be is, is, is challenging. And we, in many ways, are embracing our subjectivity, embracing our positionality. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you began uh, the session by, by speaking of your own positionality um, and, and, its, and its limitations. Um, do you, I guess this, this, this is a tricky question to answer, or, especially given how much time we have left. Uh, it, it seems like you're, you're describing in many ways a very, very challenging way to rethink information in multiple forms of education, public education, higher education, K through 12. Uh, what do you think that we are likely to see this actually expand? Do you think we're likely to see information and media literacy take off over the next, say, five to 10 years? as we try to confront um, and grapple with AI, as we try to deal with mis and disinformation. Um, and not to mention the, in, the impact on information with so many global crises that are unfolding. Uh, I mean, do you think it's likely that we'll see information and media literacy really expand and become a major focus of education? Uh, or, is it, or is it not gonna go further than it is now? I think it's, um, it, you know, the question was asked earlier, are things getting better or when will they get better? Um, I think they are getting better. I think they will get better. Um, but I, when I think about these spaces and, and, and think about the future, what I do is I look at what youth are doing. And I have said this multiple times in multiple venues, and usually I get uninvited from people's parties. Um, <laughs> I don't think that adults know how to use these spaces. Um, and and when I when I look at youth, uh, Laura does. When I look at youth, I'm really um, invigorated. I think that when we looked at COVID and emergency remote teaching, um, you know, we immediately thought, as we do with most technologies, that youth are going to use it to cheat. And so what I'd like to see us do is, and what I've been doing in, in my own home and then starting in my classroom is use these generative tools, have kids play with AI, have kids play with the tools and kick the tires and see what they can do, what they would envision with these tools and spaces. Um, that's so, so I, I think to your question, yes, I do think, think things will get better and I'm hoping that they do. Um, if we give youth the time and the space and the latitude, understanding all of what Dana Boyd would say in the hang around, messing around, geeking out group, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we need to, to allow youth to play with these tools without not, without looking at everything they create and just, you know, hyper analyzing it to make sure that they're not, you know, saying something bad about themselves or life or something like that. But Laura, mm -hmm. Doug, what are your thoughts? I just wanted to um, piggyback on what you just said there. So a decade ago, uh, Laura and I were working at Mozilla. You were contributing me into the, the web literacy map, which was underpinning a Mozilla program called WebMaker, which was trying to fight against what was identified by Mitchell Baker as elegant consumption. So trying to help people become makers um, and, and, and actually build things on the web. But we're very much now in the world of elegant consumption, despite our, our best efforts and things. And so all of these millions and billions of dollars going into AI, can we just have a percentage to spend on, on media education? Otherwise, we're going to end up in the world of Wally, -E, where mm -hmm. a human with humans with chubby fingers 
are going to be moving around on screens, just poking their fingers at things. And that is not a world I want to live in. Mm, mm, I hear that. Again, with science fiction, um, which is which is very, very powerful. Laura, I guess you get the last word. Uh, well, I know that we're over time, so I guess I'll just say thank you for having us. And I am 100% sure that Ian, Doug, and I can talk about these themes all day long. Um, but since the hour's up, I'll just say thanks. Thanks well, for listening. Thanks. thanks for your great questions. Thank you. Uh, and especially thank uh, both you and Doug for coming to us uh, on European time. Um, and if, um, if although I'm not sure, Doug, if it's still okay to call Britain European. Um, <laughs> but, um, I, I would uh, perhaps like to have you all back uh, in a few months once uh, once your podcast series continues further and as uh, the formal edition of this appears. Let me just quickly ask, what's the best way to keep up with your work, each of you? Uh, let's start with Laura. How do we, how do we keep up with what you're up to? Uh, I guess I would say either Mastodon, I'm on social.coop as at Epileptic Rabbit, um, yes. my newsletter, which is freshlybrewed.substack.com, or LinkedIn, which I hate but use. <laughs> I, I I'm not on Twitter you, anymore. So. I, I don't know anybody who's a fan of LinkedIn, but, but we, do, we do use it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Doug, uh, what's the best venue for us to keep up with you? Um, uh, I don't post to social stuff as much as I used to. Um, so I'm going to say, just go to my website, dougbalshaw.com. Um, I write on my blog regularly. I've got a one called Thor Shrapnel, thorshrapnel.com. Um, and then just our blogs, the We Are Open blog, we try to post on there pretty regularly as well. Um, and I've already dropped AIliteracy.fyi into the chat. Um, I am not on TikTok, Lisa. I think my son does enough TikTok for the Northeast of England. <laughs> thank you thank you doug and, and ian same thing uh i don't post as much to social as i used to um i um everything is on my newsletter my my blog i just try to think out loud um i'm inspired by these two individuals and just i just try to put my random yammerings out online um so that's the best place and i'll drop the links in there well, I'm inspired by all three of you. Um, I really, really appreciated this 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 fantastic hour uh, with just so much good stuff. Uh, friends in the chat, I'm going to uh, add this to my list of uh, of chats to post to my blog once the recording is going uh, and once the recording is ready. Um, Laura, Doug, Ian, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Um, we will bring you back. We'll bring thank you. Back. Let's keep the discussion okay. going. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Take okay. care. Thanks, Be safe everyone. and good. Good luck moving, Doug. Uh, uh, and friends, um, I'm also inspired by all of your questions and the huge amount of knowledge that you surfaced. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. If you'd like to keep talking about this, uh, we do have presence on the socials, as they say. Uh, here you can find me on Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, and Blue Sky. It's using the hashtag FTTE. Um, if you'd like to uh, look back into our previous sessions where we talk about information literacy along with these other related topics, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, looking ahead, we have more sessions coming up on online learning and free speech on campus. Just go to our forum.futureofeducation.us site. And thank you all again for thinking and talking with us all. I have to run to my next meeting, I'm afraid, but I really want to thank you all and wish you all the very best for this November. Take care. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.